So when we talk about requirements in this context, we're often in a position of having to advocate that the engineers who will develop the more detailed systems, specifically the systems and software engineers who are actually building the products and services that we're talking about, um, we have to make sure those requirements get defined well. We as industrial engineers typically define very, very high-level stakeholder requirements. We'll, st we'll typically start off with architectural or high-level or conceptual operations requirements as we get into the high-level project. But it reaches the point in a project where the requirements get detailed enough that you're now talking about the detailed requirements for software or for hardware or for organizational change, requirements that we allocate to someone else. So at that point, we may stay involved, but, the, but this, the focus in this class is really the high-level requirements. Are we using management information systems effectively to drive and improve or the organizations in which we work? That's really our role as industrial engineers. So we're typically very, very high-level requirements and then advocating that the allocation of those requirements be done in a very rigorous way. That's why I call this presentation requirements advocacy more than elicitation or definition, because really we want to understand requirements concepts well enough to support a host of different disciplines that might be defining requirements as they go through. Wow, I'm really close here, aren't I? I'm just going to take a second to drag this table out of my way, or else I'm going to break my neck just trying to look at these slides. Okay. Yeah, that's way out there. Okay. So what we're doing here, and the slides themselves are from a, a broader software engineering system engineering course that I use. I don't worry about the titles of the slides per se, it's just a set of concepts that I want to cover today. Uh, we, want to, we want to look at what requirements are and define what requirements quality really is. Some of the, from quali qualitatively, the requirements you gave me on your activities were correct requirements. I had no trouble seeing that they were, in fact, requirements for the system you were talking about. And in that sense, the things you, you all turned in were not unlike exactly what I would see in the workplace. In the workplace, we don't define requirements as well as perhaps we should. So the things you turned in were actually very representative of the kinds of requirements you would write at work if you were working on a project. It's actually a very rare project that enforces some of the requirements quality characteristics we'll talk about today. Um, contractually obligated DOD projects where you've got a committee looking at requirements often write better requirements because we're contractually obligated to do so. But in a looser environment of many organizations, the thing that passes for a requirements document often isn't that rigorous. If you read it, it's right. It is, in fact, capturing the requirements. But to the extent that the imprecision of requirements leads to project problems later, um, you can see in most requirements documents that the documents we produce, in fact, embed the very problems we're eventually going to have. So we do want to be more rigorous as we go through. And the things you gave me in terms of assignments, I would have no trouble saying, yes, those are requirements for the system, the correct requirements. Um, but in terms of some of the quality characters, we do want to talk about that. We want to understand some of the various perspectives that we use to verify and validate requirements. In that sense, verification being, does the requirement statement meet the qualitative requirements I've placed on them? Is it precise? Is it unambiguous? Is it pure? We'll talk about what those requirements are. So requirements verification, we make sure our requirements are those things. Uh, it's a form of testing, a form of review, a form of inspection. And then requirements validation. Requirements validation says, can I demonstrate that the requirements I've written, when satisfied, will in fact solve the problem I was assigned to solve? So can I validate my requirements to the extent that, yes, this system, when implemented, will solve the problem I was told to solve? So this, and that's, again, a form of testing and acceptance and things of that nature. They're done at different places in, in the project lifecycle in slightly different ways, um, but those are the two V and V aspects of what we're looking at in terms of requirements as we go through, okay? So again, our starting point is to recognize that failure to properly identify and manage requirements is the single most consistent cause of project failure, regardless of the kind of project that you're on. That's a very important point. When projects fail in the real world, more often than not, they fail because of a lack of identifying proper requirements. So we, so we spend a lot of time in requirements in this class precisely because when your MIS systems either fail to be implemented, maybe at the technical level, or get implemented but don't solve the problem, it's usually going to be because your requirements for that system weren't valid in the first place. Um, so we want to talk about that. So, so the root cause of that trend basically is a lack of training. 
And again, as industrial engineers, we are not going to write, or I'm not expecting you to write, all of the requirements for any project you're going to be on. Projects get very detailed. Most of the detailed requirements for writing a software system are going to be written by either software engineers themselves or business analysts who specialize in specifying technology solutions. Um, and as, as industrial engineers, we, we prefer to work at a slightly higher level. So depending on your organization, your job may include both very easily. Um, but are we specifying the correct system be put in place okay, to make um, basically everything work the way it's supposed to work for the business? So we, we typically aren't too concerned with controlling the technical quality of the software that's written. We're really focused in this class on will it create a management system that can be used to solve the problem we've described as we go through. Okay. So some more key definitions. The requirement in this sense is an attribute or a characteristic we want our system to have. Something, something we, want, we want it to be. Requirements definition is our process. When we talk about doing requirements definition, um, the requirements definition process gets the requirements and basically documents. And the document we're talking about creating is a statement of requirement. There's often documents containing many, many statements of requirements. Um, so that's the basic terminology of the field, is that the requirement is, in fact, the thing we're talking about, not the statement of requirement. Draw a very clear distinction there. When we're verifying requirements, we're basically trying to prove that the statement of requirement accurately captures the requirement. Many organizations fall into the trap of thinking the requirement is the statement. If I comply with the statement, I'm fine. And to a certain extent, that's kind of your Crosby definition of quality. If, I, if I'm defect free, if I meet the specs, I produce a quality system. But a common problem is that the spec doesn't actually meet the requirement. So the requirement is the thing in the real world that we're talking about. The requirements definition process goes after it. And that has all kinds of names based on where you work in industry or what, what sector you work in. You'll hear terms like requirements elicitation, is the, get, is the elicitation and getting requirements out of your customer, is the analysis or the definition or the modeling. It's all kinds of sub-disciplines that work within requirements. But basically, you're modeling a system. If you've taken systems engineering, you've learned to think of things as a system, and you can gather requirements for those systems as they go through. So the requirements define the problem. It's really not until you give me the requirements that I can be absolutely sure I know the problem you're going to solve. Your project charter typically tells you the project you're being asked to solve. Um, and maybe you'll always come up with requirements for that problem. But it's not unusual during a project as you're coming up with requirements to realize that the problem you should be solving is a little different than your current charter. So there's a fluidity in that you're always working with your management team to potentially refine the problems that they want solved as they go through. Requirements bound the solution. You're not going to build something that isn't governed by your requirements. Question? This is just kind of like an awesome. Um, earlier on, you said the requirements in the software industry and the mm -hmm. IT industry. Requirements are uh, defined by the software engineers. In or, or, or analysts that specialize in creating for software. Okay, in the more uh, industrial mm -hmm. setting, where I am from, who defines it? Is it the design engineers? Who, I mean, it's not going to be the project, the IE engineer. Right. Who, well, it? it depends on how you're organized. Let me finish this slide and see if it answers your question. No, it's, 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 it's a legitimate point because like different organizations are in, di in different ways. Because remember, in the Zakun framework, we've got requirements at multiple levels of detail. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you're talking about. We tend to work as IEs okay. at that top level. In the IT world, we typically have system architects, that's a common title on the software side, who would do kind of the middle tiers, come down to the module and the function level of specifying requirements. Um, and then eventually, someone who knows how software is going to operate can specify the detail performance characteristics and stress characteristics of the software itself. So as you go down the Zachman framework through its five levels, you increasingly need to know the field you're targeting to use the correct language and gather the correct requirement. So at the systems level, you know, Zachman level row one, Zachman row two, and the intersection of those, we're dealing with systems terminology. Um, as you move down row three, row four, and row four, and their intersection, you're dealing with architectural terminology. You're talking about subsystems to collections to polymorphic variations of modules if you're in the software industry. Uh, so the terminology changes as you come down and get some more technical. At the lowest level, you know, to write a detailed specification for a software system, 
maybe I don't have to be a programmer, but I need to know whether the environment is a database environment, whether it's what the telecommunications capabilities are. I need to know whether it's an object-oriented environment, what languages will be used. So I have to write requirements that can be implemented in those kinds of environments. And you're, there's a constant friction there. So to write a good requirement, you don't want to embed the solution. So as we move down in detail, we do need to embed our knowledge of the solution space in the language of our requirement, but we don't want to include a dictate of what the solution is in the requirement. So there's this constant friction going on. So sometimes you get bad requirements documents because they're too high level. They don't provide enough guidance. And we get a lot of requirements documents that go too detailed. They provide too much guidance, and they actually constrain. And if you're in an environment where you're dictated by contract, you must implement the requirements. There's nothing more dangerous than a requirements definition that's too detailed. And in the software field, there's kind of a pattern there because the analysts to write requirements tend to be people that five years ago in their career, ten years ago, they were writing code. So when they go too detailed, they tend to go too detailed using knowledge that's five or ten years old. And they often embed obsolete technologies or invalid approaches as requirements. That's the way they would have done it, so they write it that way. And then they hand off the requirements contractually to the system's developers who look at these and say, why would we do this? Why do you want us to do this this way? But they implement it using the obsolete tone because they're contractually obligated to implement what they were given in the requirements. So there's that vicious cycle of the fact that often the people writing requirements came up from the lower technical ranks and they bring relatively obsolete knowledge with them. And this is a very common pattern in the MIS world of seeing things that way. And, and that's really the third bullet here. There's, there's always a notion of scope. Technically, the requirements define the scope. Okay. But we always know what the scope is when we do a project. So there's another friction going on there. Is how do you write requirements that should define the scope when what you're given to go research the requirements is your scope? So usually the, the core question there is, can the scope change during requirements? Is it possible for your stakeholders to give you requirements that would require you to rethink or redocument what your project scope really is? If that can't happen, then you're really being dictated from without. Someone in advance has decided exactly what your scope should be, and you have to stay inside the box. Well, that can be very, very dangerous for what a lot of organizations do. So requirements do, in fact, ultimately define the scope. Technically, everything up to a requirements definition process is speculative. Management says, here's the problem, here's what we're going to do. I authorize you to go write requirements. Go do whatever project phase you call it to go get the requirement. At the end of that phase, we're going to verify and validate those requirements, and our project stakeholders, our customers, are going to sign off that, yes, those are the requirements. It's really only then that we've locked down the scope of any given project. And one of the things we look at in project reviews is to what extent do the requirements define issues that weren't raised by the project charter. The risk there being it could be you've gone into areas that, had you known about them in advance, you might have included other stakeholders you might have altered the project constraints. So there's, there's, it's a systems model that ultimately settles on just the right spot. But to the extent the literature kind of paints a very linear picture. You're given a project charter, you put together a team, you go out and elicit requirements, you document them, you refine them, and you're off and running. It really doesn't work that way. It's a very organic process, or it should be. Um, because if you can't change your direction in response to learning the requirements, something's wrong with the requirements process. Requirements aren't meant to be the specification of the solution, they're the articulation of the problem. You can't lock that down until everyone agrees, yes, this is the articulation of the problem. And the scope in our vein is always a business system. Keep that in mind throughout this class. At no point, I may slip up and say it, but at no point in this class are we ever talking about just a software system. We do not mean MIS in that sense. There's, in this class, you could talk about an MIS system that doesn't use any computer software, but we're not going to. So for the purposes of this class, a software system, an actual computer application, whatever that means, is always a subset of our scope. We're interested in management systems that use information technology for management control. That's what we're after. One of your activities last week was to send me a list of you know, eight to 10 MISs that you interact with. Okay. I can tell you I'm, I'm fine with the results I received. I didn't get any surprises. But one of the things that doesn't surprise me is that we often don't differentiate management systems from software systems in general. 
the vast majority of what everyone sent me were basically operational transactional systems. And it's very difficult to get used to, particularly in this age where computer software is all around us. We carry smartphones around. We're constantly interacting with systems. But your day-to-day -day interaction with systems is really about transactions. Okay. Um, the challenge in this class, and it's, it'll take a few weeks, but we'll all get there together, is to, yes, recognize the transaction operational side of software information systems, but to a certain extent, for the purpose of this class, look beyond them. That's the automation side of last week's discussion. Most systems automate something. Canvas is a transactional system that automates the process of me handing out materials and you turning in assignments and me publishing the details of the syllabus. It's a really good software system for doing that. Okay. But that in and of itself doesn't make it a management information system. And most things like you know, the internet, the library system, almost everything you interact with, if you think about your day-to-day -day interaction, is in fact not a management information system. But that doesn't mean that a portion of it can't be. That's why last week's discussion, we went from automation to augmentation. Automation, the operational, the transaction side, is always a subset of a good MIS solution. There's got to be something to control. So Canvas, for instance, when you're talking about submitting an assignment, posting a discussion post, um, downloading a syllabus, that's a transactional system. If that's the way you view Canvas, it is not a management information system. But to the extent you log on to it to um, schedule time, to uh, review your, your grades, um, to see what assignments you have for the week and whether you've done them or not, those are control activities. They, you are using them to manage your time. There's no <laughs> counterpart where that's an automation of something we would have done in class. Okay, you, have to, you, you have to control yourself in terms of, wow, have I done all three discussions yet? Uh, there's five, five assignments coming up in the next month. Where do I stand on those? To the extent that you use Canvas to manage your time, you're using it as an MIS. So the system in and of itself isn't an MIS or a non-MIS. Its uses are in the functions that it supports. And most of the things we would identify as MISs, MIS is a very loose term. I've worked in IT or IS, whatever you want to call it, since the late 70s. At times, we've been called the computer department. At times, we've been in the information systems department. Then we were the MIS department. Then we were IT. Then we were IS again. Um, the names have really wandered over time. It's really hard to know uh, whether something is just an information system or a management information system. Part of this class is about recognizing that distinction. If you're on a project and all it's doing is implementing an information system, then I would challenge you to wonder why, as an IE, are you on that project? Yeah. It could be that it's an important enough project you want to make sure it's done right, so I'm not against IEs being on those projects. But as I said last week, as an IE, if I find myself on a project that is just implementing an operational system, the thing I'm going to do is try to turn it into an augmentation project from an automation project. Say, okay, great, we're, all, you know, we're, we're putting in this canvas. I can, hand, I can give you all, all your handouts on canvas. But are there any tools built in for me to check whether you've downloaded them or not, or for you to check whether if there's any new handouts you haven't downloaded yet? So I'm always challenging an IS project to say, what management function can you add, and can it be done in an expeditious way? So most systems are a blend. And as IEs, if we're doing our job, system ISs increasingly become MISs. You're working on a straightforward order processing IS system for your company. Okay. Um, so you, you take orders, you price them, you send them out to the warehouse, you produce a pick ticket, logistics pulls the goods and ships it, and you send, it, send some data to finance. So you, know, you talk about how an order processing system works in a company. Mm -hmm. But if that's the, level, that's the only level you talk about it as, you're doing an IS solution. That might be exactly what the custom, company wants and needs. But as industrial engineers, we believe it needs more. So we're constantly challenging to say, what kind of management function are you building into this? How can management see how many orders are coming through and where they are in the pipeline? Can management monitor the dollar value of them? Can we get reports or queries related to which products are most popular? Can we see which customers are ordering the most? Can we see where the backlogs are? What products are being backordered? How often are they delayed? How many of our shipments have to come out of more than one 
um, warehouse so we can optimize our material. If you're asking questions over and above those operational transactional details, you're pushing the project toward being an MIS. It's that MIS aspect where we look at the system as an input to a broader process of not just taking orders and processing, but actually trying to govern them, manage them. Okay, to produce the scorecards and dashboards that different people need to truly manage this process rather than just transact it. Okay. That's really what we're after in this class. So the scope is always then a business system. I probably oversold it at this point, but you're always dealing with that broader picture. Okay, in terms of last week's discussion, when in doubt, pull out the picture of an augmentation project where the IS system, the order processing system, if you will, Canvas, and the other system, is an input to your thinking. How can, we use, how can we take advantage of this system to truly manage our environment better as we go through? Okay. So th there's lots of different models for what requirements are, and I'm, again, I don't want to contradict any your organization uses or things of that nature. So align this with what you do in, in your workplace if this isn't the way you, your workplace would describe it. But I describe requirements in, for an MIS in terms of three types of requirements. Okay, typically we have business requirements, things the system must do. It must take orders, you know, it must price orders, it must assign them to a warehouse. Um, you know, Canvas has to be able to display modules, has to allow you to sign on. I can talk to you that the things the system has to do are the business requirements. And that's, for many organizations, when you talk about gathering requirements, that's all some people are talking about. That's where we spend most of our time. It's where we want to spend a lot of our time. Because the justification for most projects is the increased use of functionality to support the business model. So those just typically come out of the business requirements. The second category are the implementation requirements. Those are the things a system must be. Not do, but be. It must, a good system has to be maintainable, reliable, testable, correct, auditable, put any kind of word behind that, there are requirements for what constitutes a good and a bad system. You just think in your mind's eye, if you will, of some systems project you've been involved in, okay. or, or will be involved in in the future. It could be hypothetical. And just in your mind, think of it in two different ways. Think of it as the project that built a great system, okay. or over here, think of it as a project that built a mediocre system. And think about what's the difference between those two. It isn't the business requirements. It's always the implementation requirements. So, okay, some systems are just built better. Okay. Uh, so I can, I can build a system that meets all the business requirements but isn't extensible, isn't maintainable, it can't handle high stress, it can't handle high, it's not scalable to high volume. <laughs> it's just not a, as good a system as one that meets the requirements but has those characteristics. And that's what we're talking about for the implementation requirements. Sometimes they're called performance characteristics, sometimes they're called implementation requirements, sometimes they're called the abilities, maintainability, auditability. So many, many articles to refer to the abilities requirements. Those would be your implementation requirements. And the third category of requirements are the constraints. Constraints are placed on every project. And too many people refuse to accept constraints as requirements. I hear it all the time on teams that I'm on. Oh, I can't meet all the business requirements. We can't meet all the requirements because of the constraints. Okay, and my response is the constraints are requirements. Okay. No matter how many business requirements you have, you're going to implement them differently if you're told they have to be done by the end of the year versus they have to be done by the end of next year. That's a constraint. It's a requirement. And management places constraints on us. The source of constraint requirements is typically management. Sometimes it's a regulatory model, things of that nature, just the market space. There are things you have to do in a certain way. When you're in MIS doing so the software component of a big MIS, there's lots of constraints. If I work in a site that uses Oracle databases, they're not going to let me do a design that uses IBM's DB2. Even though for my project, that might be the best technology to adopt if I did a trade-off analysis, but sticking with the architecture the company has adopted typically is a constraint most projects have to live with. Okay, or the argument against it has to be so strong that it would be a pretty big project that we need to change our platform or do something of that nature. So for the most part, if, you're, if you do your ERP planning as a business using SAP, okay, for this project, you're not going to suggest moving over to, say, Oracle. You know, we, use this, we use SAP as our ERP system, so 
that's a constraint. You, you're not to propose a solution that would require us to scrap the $60 million we spent implementing SAP. Um, often budget is a constraint. Often the number of people you have to do a project is a constraint. Um, some of them are purely arbitrary, and if you build a good case, you can get them changed. Getting a few more dollars, getting a few more developers on your team are constraints that are easier to move than certain other ones. Calendar constraints are often your toughest. If they're arbitrary, you can get them to move. Sometimes it's just people want projects done quickly. But if they're rooted in a regulatory requirement or a business model requirement, you usually won't get them to move. It's very, very important to get those requirements right and then live within them. So the solution I'm going to build for a project has to meet the constraints. If I do nothing else on a project, it's supposed to meet the constraints. The constraint requirements are actually the most important to live with. The management would agree with you. Your customers might not, but manage, management would agree with you. Beyond that, what management wants is as much business requirement met as possible within those constraints. Which is why in the IS slash IT world, if, if the MIS organization sacrifices anything on a project, it's always the implementation requirements. For two reasons. One, we rarely write down all the implementation requirements, so they're the easiest to discard. We never actually documented them. Okay. And second, they're things we care about. Okay. Users, users love to say, let's test it a little less. I don't care how scalable it is. It's got to meet the current demand. The first thing we always sacrifice to maximize business function are implementation requirements. We build a system that actually isn't as good. World-class IT organizations do the opposite. They've learned that the, the, these implementation requirements are the last thing you should sacrifice. If I build you a system that's scalable and flexible and maintainable, even if I can only give you half as many business requirements as I could have if I sacrificed those things, because basically if I write bad, weak code that isn't flexible, okay, I'm in a position to give you more functionality. If I can get my user, I'll give you half of what you want right now, the most important half, because I want to build an art, I want to build a foundation that's really, really sound. And we'll come back next year with more money, and we'll add the rest of the requirements on this platform. So that idea of having thinking of every system you build not as a standoff, but as a product line to be developed. The question isn't what does the system have to be able to do? It's what does this next release of the system have to be able to do? It is a product line. So you're never talking about a system by itself. You're always talking about a release of a system. So the system we put in by year end, okay, we'll have this list of functionality that you've chosen as the top priority. And that's, that itself is a big negotiation process. Because sometimes you've got functions that users wouldn't put at the top of their list, but your analysis shows that some of the important functions are dependent on it. Customers always, you know, stakeholders always want to be able to update things. And they relegate the add things to the lower priority list, ignoring the fact that you can't update what you haven't added. So there's always this balancing and trade-off going on in terms of architectural dependencies. And, so, and software and architects and engineers are very good at that. So generally, you've got that trade-off. So never let your teams fall into the notion of thinking they're talking about the system as a monolith. For someone to say, what, what will the system be able to do when you're done? Okay, well, first of all, it's a product line. I'm never done. Okay, the release I'm working on right now, within the current constraints, here's what it will be able to do. And here's what, I, based on improving functionality in terms of the abilities, by making it scalable, flexible, maintainable, you'll be able to get a return on investment over the next few years as I go to release two, release three, release four, because I've got that foundation built. That's what mature organizations do. Okay. We're going to look at the capability maturity model from the Software Engineering Institute later in the semester. And it captures and documents some of these best practice patterns in terms of what you should do. But very often, a good software organization, it, the first release of software it creates, often doesn't have a lot of functionality to it, even though they were aware of lots more functionality that people want. But if you try to build that monolith in the first release, you might get 50%, maybe even 100% more function. But you often lock yourself into an architecture where you can never get anything more without starting over. And companies that have to start over are considered less mature. 
So a good I, uh, MIS organization will work with you to maximize the implementation requirements they can put in. So typically what you're looking at is the business requirements represent the best case scenario. The business would get maximal value if I can implement every business requirement they can come up with. No doubt about it, they're going to fight. So, so that portion of the requirements, if you look at any systems engineering lifecycle, the requirements of elicitation and analysis techniques that are used in your lifecycle will not only capture and document the requirements, but they're constantly working to prioritize them, knowing that you're not going to be able to satisfy everybody all the time. So a good requirement has to be something that's discrete enough to be prioritized as you go through. Uh, but that's really the best case. So I can do all the business requirements, remove all constraints. Okay, so I got unlimited resource. I would implement all of the business requirements every time, but we don't. Implementation requirements really are the target case. What am I really going to try to do? And when you're in an IES organization or an MIS organization, and this might not be our job as the IEs, but we want to know that it's happening. As IEs, we're always interested in facilitating better practices. Uh, a good IES organization can minimize the extra effort it takes to meet implementation requirements by having good standards and procedures. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of making a system testable is pretty standard stuff in the IT world today. Okay, there's ways I can make a system testable by how I modularize, how I design and build interfaces, um, what I build into my systems. To the, so to the extent my IT folks are well trained in how to do that, you can get a lot of implementation requirement met at low cost by standardizing. If every project team tries to figure it out again, you're going to spend a lot of money on that and it's going to be done inconsistently. So there are tricks and techniques in the industry, in the software industry, for maximizing the flexibility, maintainability, and scalability of your applications that don't require you to reinvent the wheel on every project. So if you're in an organization as an IE trying to promote these broader MIS solutions, take a look at the MIS organization itself, the people developing these systems with you. Say, how strong is your standard and procedure program? How much sure are your processes? So in essence, how much overhead are you eating up just delivering minimal on the implementation requirements? Are you building good systems? So the more we invest in a very proactive way in becoming a more mature, better information systems organization, the less conflict we see here. We just naturally create systems that have a high level of quality in terms of that second category. And if we do that, then the constraints don't damage us as much. Again, that's process maturity. To what extent, if I've got to do um, a bread box worth of software for my company, how much resource does it take? Okay, if I, a highly productive MIS organization can get more business requirement met within the same constraints. Okay. Um, so that's another area where you as an industrial engineer can look. Anything you invest in from your skill set in helping the MIS organization be higher quality, more efficient, more process mature will help on the MIS end. You'll get more bang for the buck if you apply your IE skills to improving the actual IS organization and the way it operates. We had a slide last week that talked about the two ways we approach the life cycle. The one on the top, the top of the slide was work to improve the IS organization. The bottom slide is use MIS to improve organizational business processes. So most of this class is about that lower tier of that diagram. But to get it, the more we can do as IEs to help the IS organization be more mature, the more it helps the organization overall as we go through. Okay. Uh, there's a requirements fallacy I want to make explicit that many organizations fall into this trap. The fallacy is that requirements analysis is primarily for the purpose of transferring knowledge from the customer to the producer. I see this all the time in organizations. You'll actually see it written up at times in organizations that make it part of their process to say, well, we're IS, our job is, is, is to build systems. It's up to the users, the customer, to give us the requirements. Okay. That's, it's a fallacy to think that works. As, as analysts on the IS side, we struggle to write good requirements because the skill sets necessary to do that. As industrial engineers, we're used to looking at systems, kind of decomposing them, and get, figuring out what all those requirements are. 
the customer base we're developing these systems for has no such knowledge and no such training. They are not in a position to define requirements. They don't know what the requirements are. When you try to force customers to define their own requirements, they almost always take their current problem and write the negative of it. Okay, if inventory is too high, they say the requirements to lower inventory. That's a big deal. That doesn't make that a good requirement. It's not even necessarily the right requirement. Okay, there might be lots of root causes behind that we really ought to go after. It's wrong to think that customers can simply deliver requirements to producers and that we just have to implement those requirements and we're fine. Again, a more, a more mature MIS organization today will recognize that's not what we do. But there was, I can remember times in my career where I was told, you don't need to worry about requirements. And the project won't start until the customers give you the requirements. So they either wrote really bad ones and we got started, or they never wrote them, they didn't know how, and the project never happened. That's, to me, that's just not good service. Requirements are an emergent property. We don't really know what the requirements are. It, are until the producers work with the customers to figure out what's possible and what's going on. So customers are good at defining their problems, they're good at defining their goals and where they want to go, they're good at laying out some constraints, and that's great raw material, but that's not requirements. That's the stuff we have to gather in order to write requirements. So a good sound methodology, and I don't know what, your, what organizations you might work in, what method, system engineering methodologies you use, there's very big formal ones like the, the DOD, system engineering methodology. There's extremely informal ones in some sectors. I work in healthcare. We tend to not have a methodology at all. Okay. When I work in an organization that doesn't have one, I look to ISO 12207. 12207 is an international standard generic life cycle for developing information systems. In the DOD environment, it would probably be underkill. They're looking for formalities that ISO wouldn't deliver. In the healthcare environment, it's overkill. If I tried to use it all, say, at a hospital setting on a project, they, they couldn't handle it. I, even there, I've got to strip it down to less. But in a vacuum, if you're working in an organization that has no MIS processes at all, okay, at the very least, introduce them to ISO 12207. They forget the details. So let's at least organize our projects according to the five phases of ISO. It'll give us at least some rudimentary structure so we can start to improve our processes. Okay. So requirements emerge as we go through. So when you're done, the, re the customers look at it and say, yeah, that, those requirements will meet my needs. And we want to be able to look at it and say, those requirements appear to meet your needs, and although we have some trade-off analysis to do to figure out how, we're pretty sure we can meet them. Then you know you've got the requirements. And there's lots of dimensionality to that. Like I said, trade-off in terms of different options, different ways to do it. Okay, we have last week's emergent model where some of these things are feasible, some of them are possible, where we have to look at some of these requirements and decide what we can do. So it's, it's not an easy road coming through here, but to the extent we accept it as an emergent model, we'll manage it better than thinking the requirements are out there, the customer just won't tell us what they are. They don't know. They really don't know as they go through, particularly since a lot of their knowledge is obsolete. Like I say, within IS, we have analysts. And if I were to specify... If I were to specify today what I think the requirements are, say, for an order processing logistics system, I know that half of what I'd be thinking about as I do that would be the order processing logistics systems I implemented back in the 80s and 90s. And some of that will be correct. If I can stay pure, if I can really stay on what's the function being done, chances are a lot of it will be correct. But I know I'll get sloppy and I'll start to dictate how some of it gets done. And I know chances are a lot of that is wrong. So, you know, getting it right, and that, that's what the qualitative characteristics we're going to move to our design to try to give us. In terms of requirements defects, there are three kinds, okay? Um, incompletely defined requirements are actually the most common in the IS world. We call that a defect of omission, that we don't get all the, right, all the requirements. And that's precisely why, last week, I, I emphasized making the problem bigger. Go from automation to augmentation. Because I know that when the requirements are wrong when you're done, it's going to, most of it's going to be because you missed a third of the requirements. Okay. And one of the reasons we miss requirements is our requirements models are weak. We don't know how to gather requirements. We don't know how to make the picture bigger. The other is organizational bias. You, you might work in an organization that resists having you even write down a requirement that someone hasn't already told you is within scope. Management is afraid of requirements definition. It tends to make the problem bigger because they're thinking monolith. 
if, if you're funding the development of a model, if everything you identify has to be done now, then you're very afraid of additional requirements. If you're funding release one, okay, you don't have to be afraid of additional requirements. Because you know you're going to, whatever, whatever I don't, no matter how many requirements you come up with, you're going to implement the list of the most important that can be done within the constraints. There's no reason to fear a lower priority requirement because you're not going to implement it right now. So go ahead and capture it. There's no reason you shouldn't fear a high level requirement bumping something from the list. You should rejoice. Say, wow, I'm glad we spotted that. It's really important. I'm glad we're including it in this release. And the people that tend to be disappointed, if you're only going to do 10 requirements, the people that don't want a new number two added to the list are the people that want number 10. This is going to fall to number 11 and you're not going to do it. So there are some politics in the requirements process. Your challenge as an engineer is to stay out of it. It's not my job as an engineer to prioritize the customer's requirements. Let them battle it out. As soon as you put yourself in a position of you trying to prioritize requirements, you've lost. You will lose. Make them do it. Make, them, make all your stakeholders argue amongst themselves. Put them in a room, say, here's the 100 requirements we've come up with. Tell me the top 10. Tell me the top 20. And let them work it out in the room until they can decide. It's their requirements. It's going to be their system. I'll implement any requirements they decide are the important ones. Okay, but I'm not going to make those decisions for my customer base. Don't do that. You'll fail every time because it'll change 20 times before you're done. But that idea of expanding the scope of what you're talking about is important because the majority of pro defects in MIS systems today are defects of omission. We didn't put something in we should have put in. And that can happen on any system. Okay. Um, I, 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 I can write software for a new cash register. Okay. I hope, you know, I'm collecting money and I'm giving receipts. It's a very simple function. But as an IRS rule, it says if I accept more than $5,000 in a cash transaction, I have to send a notice to the IRS. I hope someone caught that requirement. If they didn't, I'm going to have a non-compliant software and my, cu my customers are going to sue me when the IRS has them paying penalties. That's the kind of requirement people tend to miss. It tends to be the exception, the extreme case. And our job is to make sure these discussions go deep enough to spot those things. It's a defect of omission. The second category of defect is the incorrectly defined requirement. We actually get it wrong. You wanted blue balls, we scored a spec for red balls. We just got it wrong. And those kinds of defects in the software world, up until mid to late 1990s, they were the most common problem that we really suffered from. We probably suffered from a lot of omitted requirements also, but the reality is the requirements we knew about didn't result in software that worked. In 1982, the Norton Group did their study of what kinds of IT projects were successful, um, doing, doing surveys across industry. And they basically found that 85% of all software projects delivered absolutely nothing. Nothing. So it really didn't matter if they had a lot of omitted requirements, because the ones they knew about, they didn't satisfy. You know, there were days, we don't have those days anymore, but I can remember working as a DBA at the Exxon Corporation um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And I can remember the office building we were in was, was very long hallways with offices in them. And way down the end of the hallway was the room you could go to if you needed to use a computer terminal. This is all pre-PCs. So there was a terminal room down there, and you could go down, and you could use a terminal to access the computer back in those days. Back in those days, though, the computer was down so often, it was offline, that they had a serious productivity problem. Their solution was to put a little green and red light over the outside of the door. So you didn't waste your time walking all the way down there if the computer was down. You could see the red light all the way up the hall. That's, that's, how, in, that's how ineffective software technology was back then. That more than half the day, I'd look out of my office and see a red light, and I'd go back to my desk and do something else. And I was an IT guy. You know, if you saw the little green light, you went running down the hall to do anything you built up on your list of things you were going to do when the computer became available. Nobody thinks that way anymore. Okay. Back in those days, it's because things were wrong. We had bad software. There's still some bad software out there, but a lot less of it than there used to be. Now, when we don't like software, it's usually because we don't like what it does, which means it's not meeting my business requirements as opposed to what it is, just plain bad software. Now, like I said, it's still plain bad software out there. But for the most part, 
wrong defects have kind of taken care of themselves. You work with a reputable company and a reputable organization. Chances are your software teams, your MIS group, your MIS functions in your company are probably creating good software. Or if they're not creating it, they're acquiring it from vendors who do. That's not the big problem in our industries anymore. And we also have the issue of unnecessarily defined requirements. That's a defect from a quality standpoint. If you define something as a requirement that isn't a requirement, you've introduced a defect into your requirements document. And we call that the extra defect. Uh, it's the extra bells and whistles, things that you, the company doesn't really need, but you put in. The fancy stuff, the pretty stuff. Okay, the, the, you know, the capability to do things that the company doesn't have any interest in doing. Now, you have to be careful here, because to some stakeholders, every requirement looks extra. Even at the level of business versus implementation requirement, we want to make an investment in making our software scalable and maintainable. Well, chances are everything we write to do that is considered a luxury by the people that want the next business requirement satisfied. So it's, there's some trade-off going on there. For the most part, when you write down to do or require something that isn't really required, okay, you're, you're making a defect. Because every requirement you write is going to result in software being written has to be tested, maintained, documented, but there's a cost associated with every line of code you create. For every requirement statement, I worked as the quality director of the Mars Corporation for a number of years. We had a good metric program. We knew for every business requirement statement written, we were going to spend 3.4 person days implementing. So we could tell you the cost of each requirement statement and where that cost would be. About two days doing the implementation, about a half a day doing the testing, about a half a day doing revision, and about the, point four, the extra point four was on the implementation end of it. So we could tell you the incremental cost of every additional requirement statement added to one of our documents. That's not a universal number. You can't apply that number across industry because every, every company measures differently. But within our company, the way we measured, we knew that was the incremental cost of each of these statements. Had we had a more detailed requirements document, Say, instead of one requirement, our process produced 10, it would have been you know, not 3.4, but 0.34 per. So you have to look at the measurement program of a company before you can generalize the statements they make. But the basic idea that every requirement statement consumes resource, that you basically have to maintain forever. You know, if I've got a defect rate of 40% in my code, so I've got just as many defects in the code I didn't need to write in the first place, but I still have to fix them. So extra defects can cost you a lot. Um, there's a lot going on there in terms of uh, defects. So notice how all these different dimensions, quality, your business model, prioritization, your relationship with stakeholders, these are all things that require the skills of an industrial engineer type of person. You're doing organizational change, organizational prioritization, politics, um, op basically optimization of your process flow. These are all things we've got classes and training in to try to deal with as we go through. The typical root causes of many of those defects, just talking about those quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, technological, so it's the feasibility of the solution is often that challenge. Um, there, there may be it's, it's extra or it's omitted or something. You know, we tend to omit things we don't think we can do. A big cause of omission defects on requirements is someone will suggest a requirement in a meeting, and I've seen it. Someone else in the room will say, ah, th there's no way to do that. And the person who gives it and says, okay, okay, I guess I don't need it. That's wrong. They do need it. It's just not feasible right now. You want to document the requirements. Don't let people self-censor and not write down things they need because someone in the room tells them it can't be done. Requirements definition is not about whether it can be done or not, but often that perception that something can't be done. Not even that it's not technically feasible, but we're trying to get this thing written by the end of the year. Someone suggests some big idea that would take longer. So, oh, no, that's not, a, that's not really a requirement. Yes, it is. It's a requirement that's not possible now because it's in conflict with one of the constraints. But let's get it written down. Things we often think can't be done quickly sometimes can be. But if it's not in the requirements document and we turn it over to the architects, they can't even consider it. Plus, as an architect, I know I want to make my system as flexible as possible. So it helps me to know the things people want to be able to do in the future. If I'm literally doing architecture on someone's home, one of the key questions I ask of a future homeowner is, what are your expansion plans? So when I put the wall in over here, I don't want to put 16-inch studs completely if I know you're going to come back next year and put a room on the end of the house. 
well, behind your sheetrock, I want to go ahead and box out that door. So I don't have to rip that wall out to put a door in for it. I just have to cut the sheetrock. But I want to know you're going to add a room over there, and that's where the door is going to be. So you're not paying the money to build the door now, but I'm building in flexibility by knowing where your expansion is. Okay. If I know, you, maybe I won't add a door, but I know you want to add on to this room. You want to make this room longer. Well, I better put a, a heavier joist across that ceiling because what you're telling me is this wall will not always be load-bearing. It is now. I could save money by making it load-bearing now. But I'll certainly raise the cost of removing it later. When you put a steel joist across the top, and you'll let the steel carry the load. I'll just put a, a flush wall in with 2x4s, and later I can rip them out because I've already put the load onto the side frames. Those are things we should be doing. That's an architecture example, but we can do the same thing in information systems. You think someday you're going to want to post a message out to some web service when this happens? Let's put that exit into the software now, even though we're not implementing it. Because if I have to come back next year and add those pieces to this part of the software, I'm, I'm opening up a can of worms. We, we have these discussions in software all the time. And unfortunately, we can't discuss future expansion of requirements that nobody's written down. It's really important to write them all down. Sometimes it's just organizational. People can't agree on who would be responsible for things. Um, again, our, as industrial engineers, we have an eye toward organizational design. We look at the human factor side of things. An IT technician often just throws up their hands and doesn't have training or even awareness of some of the issues beyond the technology they're used to dealing with. To do good requirements, you really have to be able to look at your organization as a system and understand how it works. And IT folks, particularly back when I entered the field, we're known for being almost the opposite of organizational mentors. Uh, we were the guys in the, the geeks in the cubicles that couldn't talk to anybody. The worst people to have to make organizational design changes as we go through. Uh, so group dynamics, historical changes, things of that nature. Um, so what kind of, what do we look for in these defects? Like I said, it could be omitted, it could be wrong, it could be extra. But what are we talking about in terms of the qualitative characteristics of requirement statements? Basically, this, this is one of your core lists. You'll, you'll see different people with different lists as they go through. Um, but this list of 10 things, most people have things that are something in this category as they go through. So, you know, is the requirements document complete? Does it completely capture the requirement? Is it correct? Okay. If I implement the requirement, will it meet the need? Is it clear? Can everybody understand it? Lack of clarity is a big problem when you're going to pass the requirements document to the next person and expect them to implement your requirement. Is it consistent with all the other requirements? Now, you can have very well written requirements, but when you put two or three of them together, you realize it, it, they're not all pointing in the same direction. Uh, is it relevant to the real problems? That gets at your luxury aspect of your, of your omission. Is, is it testable? You've got to be able to test a requirement to know that it's a true requirement. Now, now again, these are, these are the quality characters we look for. I've written, I've implemented lots of requirements that I didn't know how to test. But there's a risk there. So risk management kicks in. Sometimes you've got to make decisions to not go with certain things. Uh, look, at, look at major systems like 1980s Ronald Reagan Star Wars program. Let's design lasers to shoot to, from space to shoot down nuclear missiles. Okay. There's no problem identifying the requirements for that system. But the system couldn't be tested. Who's willing to shoot a nuclear missile at someone to see if the system can shoot it down? There's certain things that just can't be tested. Uh, and that creates problems on the requirements side. Traceable. They have to be traceable to each other. Typically, you're starting with some kind of a problem statement. You can come up with your stakeholder. You're going to translate that into stakeholder requirements. Okay? Those stakeholder requirements typically get refined then into functional type requirements. And the terminology can vary based on your organization. But you'll say, what functions do I have to introduce in order to meet these stakeholder requirements? And then you're going to have requirements for the technology, the system requirements. What system requirements do I need to implement those functional requirements? So you need traceability amongst those. I have to know that if you challenge a system requirement, one of the ways you challenge is say, which function does it support? Or a functional requirement. Why is this here? What business requirement does it support? And enforcing traceability is a huge tool we use to improve the quality of the requirements that we have in our system, particularly the defect of omission. Often you'll have functional requirements that don't map to a stakeholder requirement. Or you'll have stakeholder requirements for which there are no functions. 
And you can, you can attack it from either side based on where your comfort level is. I tend to attack it top down. Almost any requirements document I write at a stakeholder level, I make sure to add a regulatory category that may, often many of the users don't even think of because it's embedded in their world. So I'll say, okay, if you, if you system handling any kind of money, one of the requirements should be that it adheres to standard accounting practices. If it's doing any kind of shipping, receiving kind of stuff at all, I say that this, this should be a requirement to adhere to U.S. postal regulations. Okay. If it's accepting money from customers or making payments to third parties, I'll add a requirement that it has to adhere to all IRS regulations. Now, that sounds pretty simple. Why, who wouldn't comply with those things, right? But if I've got them in that high-level stakeholder requirements, even though nobody values them, nobody's going to prior to that, that's my most important piece. Although as, as the project progresses, they start to see how important it can be. But when I'm doing functional requirements, what will happen is people will list all the functions they want to have for their business requirements. And later, I'm going to do an audit. I'm going to look at the traceability aspect and say, okay, all of your functional requirements map back to a this is a stakeholder requirement, but I've got these three stakeholder requirements right here. I don't see any functions that support them. Okay. I'm at the drill in pretty deep, but I look at all the functions that handle any kind of an address. Say, where are your requirements to make sure it's properly formatted to U.S. specs? Okay. Are your cities and zips correct according to U.S. postal regulations? Or do, you, do you format domestic versus international addresses correctly? That's functionality that needs to be added. That's, that's omitted if I don't drive it. It's the IT part. If I don't document that I've got to handle the format of international addresses somewhere in the functionality, then when the technician builds the code to do that function, they won't know to provide for that level of variability. Or if they've seen it before, they'll go ahead and put that variability in, knowing it's needed, and now I've got a system that implements something that wasn't in the requirements document. I lose that traceability. So as an industrial engineer, I tend to drive it by pushing the stakeholder requirements. I usually hit the regulatory, regulatory category, postal regs, tax regulations, um, you know, um, import-export restrictions. You know, just any, any kind of thing I've learned over time impacts our business, and it helps if you know your business. But every project gets this list of stakeholder requirements added to it. And that completely changes the way everyone approaches the design of the system. Okay. And again, if you're in a less mature organization that doesn't do this kind of work, take a look at some of their historical projects. You'll often see some big project implement a system over a one or two year period. The following year is a big maintenance project to add or fix a bunch of things. Take a look at what they fixed. It's always this stuff. Some of the compliance to regulations just isn't there. Some of the auditability is not there. So if we can get it into the requirements in the first place, we, we go a long way. So that traceability piece is really important. We tend to talk in terms of tracing the requirement back to why we wrote it. But that reverse is just as true, tracing forward to what happened to this requirement in your implementation. And again, you might have a requirement that moves forward to function and someone says, we're going to treat that as out of scope for this release of the software. That's the stakeholder customer management decision. If management wants to say, look, do the first release, handle only domestic U.S. addresses. We'll come back later and add international. That's, it, they're entitled to say that. It's their requirements. It's their risk. But at least now the developer, when writing the specs for the software, sees that the next release is probably going to have to handle international addresses. Okay, so don't make, basically, don't make zip code a number. Because as soon as you've got a Canadian address, your system's going to fail. Or any other address, for that matter. So, so knowing the future requirement, knowing something that's coming next, can alleviate a lot of problems. Nothing worse than a, an address field in a database with a numeric zip code. Okay. It's, it's really, really painful. Okay. Because you can't load international addresses into that database. It fails. If you're lucky, you've got a database mature enough to at least capture the, hey, that's a bad thing. Most databases, IBM's DB2, Oracle, um, languages like Java, C, you try to put that in, the job just blows out. It fails. You come in in the morning and say, oh, last night's load of orders failed. Why? I don't, we don't know. Something happened at the database load. Okay. So these are things that can be avoided completely if people are gathering requirements correctly as they go through. 
Another one is purity. Purity is a big one for me. Um, because purity basically says the requirement you've written does what the current requirement needs to do. So if you're writing a stakeholder requirement, it talks about what the stakeholder needs, not what functions you're going to deliver to provide it. It's pure. Okay. If you're writing a functional requirement, it describes the function you have to deliver, not how you're going to deliver it. If you're writing a system requirement, you're talking about how you're going to do something, how you're going to do the function, but without getting into the technology you're using to implement it. People say code is self-documenting. That might be true, but not in terms of requirements. Okay. So purity says as you're writing your requirements, you stick to what you're supposed to be talking about. So if I'm doing a functional model, I might tell you that I need, um, I, I need high level of encryption. Because encrypting my data meets my requirements, say, for privacy. So maybe I've got a stakeholder requirement that all the data has to be very, very private and confidential. So that's the stakeholder requirement. A bad stakeholder requirement might say the data has to be very private through encryption. That's not pure, because I've introduced the function that will perform it to the stakeholder requirement. So if, I, so if the stakeholder requirement is all data must be encrypted, then sure enough, they have to encrypt the data. If the requirement is all data has to be private and confidential, there might be a lot of ways to do that. So we want a very pure requirement. Okay. So my function requirement might decide the best way to meet the stakeholder need for privacy is to encrypt the data. We will encrypt it. Okay. As I move on, I might decide to use secure sockets protocol on my system spec. I'm going to use HTTPS, basically, instead of HTTP. And that will deliver the encryption I want. But that's one kind of encryption. It would have been a mistake at the functional level to say, I'll beat the privacy requirement by using secure sockets. That's the kind of mistake we make as managers because 10 years ago, that's how I would have done it. So if I'm not trying to stay pure, I'll, I'll write the requirement today and say, use sockets for your encryption. When in reality, that's not pure. I have no idea if sockets is currently the best way to do it. That's up to the people that write system specs. Don't try to do someone else's job. Do your job. So the stakeholder requirement is privacy, confidentiality. The functional spec says encryption. The systems people decide what's, what's the best means to provide encryption today. Maybe it's sockets, maybe it's not. I don't know. I still go to a lot of websites that use sockets, so I assume it's still pretty good. But I don't know that. I'm not a, I don't know the technologies. I just know that I'm, I want to use encryption. Encryption to me seems better for transmitted data than, say, um, password screens, things like that. I might also use one of those blurry screens on my device if I'm in a busy populated area. There's lots of system things I might do to properly blind people to the content of a message. But the, the basic function I'm providing is I'm encrypting the data so others can't interpret it. That's a functional statement. So that ability to stay pure, it also has to be usable. Can, can I, does, the, does the requirement basically, is it something I can use to implement the system? Or is it, you know, you know is it vague? Is it... And modifiability is key. If I can't modify the requirement, we often have to split requirements into smaller pieces to make sure we understand how we would change them over time uh, going forth. So those are just, like I said, you'll see slightly different names for these things. Um, there's, there's no universal to this. It, where I get my names is I get them from IEEE. Um, the IEEE 1233 standard is the standard for writing requirement statements. Not all organizations have adopted it. I don't know if yours has or not. Uh, but these are the terms and the definitions that you would see if you looked at IEEE 1233, which I think is the most recent version. was like 2008 or something. 1233. Yeah, 1233. I'm pretty sure of that number. But just look for the standard for requirements. I'm pretty sure it's 1233. Uh, when in doubt, I try to turn to a standard every time. Uh, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And I tend to move from organization to organization, so I also try not to embed myself too closely into the methodologies of my clients. So I do need to be, I need to be portable. Um, in your case, you might work for an organization that's already adopted different standards. Certainly work with those. Uh, but if they don't have standards, now I've gone into organizations that had a standards committee trying to define what a good requirement would look like. I see, have you looked at any of the international standards? Says what standards? You know, we, you know, all too often in organizations, we go off and try to invent something. And if you see, so if you have no IT life cycle and there's a team trying to put one together, point them at ISO 12207. It's trying to define a good requirement statement, point them to I, 
IEEE 1233. This is pretty much an international standard for almost everything we do in this field today. So if some, you see someone in the room trying to whiteboard and brainstorm a better way to do something, you know, step in and say, hey, you know, standards might save you a lot of time here. You don't have to adopt the standard. You can adapt it if you don't want to adopt it. Say, well, we saw that standard, but we don't, we don't like it per se. Then just write a tailoring guide. I can write a 20-page version of my own standards Okay. Or I can, I can adapt the standards and say, use 1233 with these five exceptions. Okay? Good enough. I can make that a lot easier. Now, now the whole world is maintaining my standard for me. There's a whole committee of people who every few years review that standard and decide if it's right and if it needs to be made better. So by adopting someone else's standards, our processes get better through someone else's work. It's free. For the most part. I mean, it's not absolutely free, but... But it can be, it's close. So these, so these terms will vary based on where you see them, but the intent uh, is what we're after here as we go through. Okay. Things that aren't requirements. And this, is, this is a slide that makes sense in this class, be a slightly different list in other contexts. But basically, there's never a requirement for a system. Just, just etch that in your brain. There's never a requirement for a system. Systems are responses to requirements. You have a requirement, I'll implement a system. Okay. But we don't tend to use that language in the vernacular. Most IT projects I've ever been involved in, if you read their project chart, is to develop some specific IT system. Not to solve some specific business problem, but to implement some specific IT system. Now that's vernacular. We're not, we're not going to change the way people talk about projects. So the, the order processing project is going to implement an order processing system, whether we like it or not. Um, but as long as we recognize that's the case, um, that introduces the danger that if we found that, well, order processing is not really the problem, it's inventory loading and balancing that's the problem you're trying to solve, the answer isn't a new order processing system. So the name of the project can become a political problem. And that's why you've got to be careful how you talk about requirements. Because as you identify real requirements against the real problem, you might find that the thing they ask for as the solution is wrong. They ask for a new system because the old system can't solve the problem. But when you look for the root cause, you find out that when you fix the root cause, the old system will be fine. And I've seen this time and time again over the years. You can, tell, you can probably tell a lot of my experiences in logistics. I do a lot of order processing work. Uh, so I'm a data warehouser and marketing uh, report person. But again, take, take order processing. I've seen companies invest $10 million in a new order processing system because the old system couldn't do cross-warehouse transshipments. So I asked them, I'll say, well, why are you doing so many cross-warehouse transshipments? They'll say, well, because our logistics system is not that good at forecasting. We often send things to the wrong warehouse. So why didn't you fix that problem? So things are in the right warehouse. If you would fix that problem, would you have spent this $10 million on this new system? Of course not. Because all they got out of it was transshipments, which they only needed because the other system was bad. But that's what they did. They define the problem as we need a new system that can do this thing. And a good requirements analyst would have said, no, you don't. Okay. What you need is to fix this problem to make the problem you're talking about go away. I've also seen companies that implement brand new systems to add new functions that were in their old system, but they were turned off. So why did you turn them on the old system? Well, we didn't know it was there. Millions of dollars get wasted on this kind of stuff. All because bad requirements get defined. Nobody really analyzes the problem. And sometimes it's actually embedded in the name of the project. So don't let the system become the requirement. That's how you avoid this. If somebody asks for a system, and it could be in any of these, you know, I need a new module, I need a new report. Nobody needs a new report. They need information. Ask them why they need the information and where they would go for it today. Why do you, th why do you think you need a new report? And very often they don't. So don't let people define system components as stakeholder requirements. Because the definition of quality for some people is conformance to, to the requirements. Does the product meet the spec? Does the spec support the requirements? Well, if the requirement is for a new system, and I build a new system, then I pat myself on the back for delivering quality. Even though it was a complete waste of money and didn't solve the problem. I did what I was asked to do. Is something I hear time and again in IT organizations. Why did you build the system that way? That's what the customer asked for. I said, do you, if you needed a new system, would you ask your customer which one to buy? No. We know more about systems than they do. Then why are you implementing systems that they ask for? 
work with them. It's an emergent property. Their job is to tell us what they need. Our job is to show them what's there and can be done. And we converge on this thing called requirements when we're done. And everybody is satisfied that this will solve your problem, and we think we can implement this. We only think, but we're fairly confident we can do something about these requirements. And that's really what's going on in the requirement state. Verification, like I said, it's making sure that you define the requirements right. When you're verifying requirements, you're looking at the requirement itself. Think, is it clear? Is it usable? Is it maintainable? Is it pure? Okay. Those are the things you're looking for in requirements. You can could, you could have a very highly verified requirement that is not valid. It's actually wrong. But it's a well done requirement. I've seen many very well written requirements. And when you're contractually obligated to write good requirements, that's what you tend to get. You know, at different ends of the continuum, you know, like I said, I've done work for the Pentagon. I don't like doing work for the Pentagon, but I do a lot of work. I've done work for the Pentagon. One thing I don't like about the Pentagon is they're really strict on their methodology. They really enforce this, the rightness. They, they seem more concerned with whether the requirement is correctly written and pure than whether it's really a requirement or not, which is validation. I want to invest my time in validation, okay, which is making sure you define the right requirements. Okay. A well-written requirement that's actually not a requirement isn't a good thing. I'd rather have a book full of badly written requirements, but no, these requirements really do represent the problem. And you can have very successful organizations that write terrible documents. You don't tend to. The general trend is the higher the quality of your requirements, the more successful your organization. But there's certainly exceptions to that where you get a good enough team. Okay. I'd like to think I've been on some of them, but who knows. You get a good enough team who's done this long enough, they've been in the organization, they write good software, they understand the business, that even given a badly written requirements document that points at the right problem, they will in fact solve the right problem. It doesn't always happen, so we'd rather improve the quality of the requirement also. But if I have to sacrifice one or the other, I'm going to sacrifice the verification over the validation. Like I said, really clean requirements that, that point in the wrong direction aren't doing me any favors. But we, have to, we typically have to do both as we go through. Um, typical requirement issues, this is a long list, I'm not going to go through all the details of the list, you can read this offline as you go through. But these are the kinds of things you want to look for when you're QA, QCing someone's requirements document. And as you internalize this list, if you've been on more than a couple of requirements reviews, you're going to find that you've seen you know, a lot of these items over time. But, but missing information, alignment with the enterprise, authorization, these are all things that can impact us as we go. The last one being you know, one of my favorites is that the requirements as written won't, won't comply with regulations. That issue of adding those extra requirements that I mentioned, another reason I do that is that often the scale, scope, and cost of the project is a function of the number of requirements here. How many dollars can you invest per requirement? So if, so if I've got a year to implement a project, I think is only 50 requirement statements, high-level stakeholder requirement statements, okay? then basically I could take a 50th of a year to do each. But if I think there's 10 more requirement statements that didn't get documented, if it turns out they're there, we're better at adding the requirement late than we are going back and getting more money. So users will agree, oh, yeah, you're right, that's a requirement. We missed that. Let's add that to the list. Well, can the project take longer or cost more? No, 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 you've committed to those things. So you're stuck with the constraints, and the scope keeps getting larger. We call that scope creep. Scope creep is a sign that you've omitted requirements that the business can't live without, so they, in fact, get added. Part of the defense against that is the release <laughs> approach. Yeah, we missed it. It's important, but we're halfway through the project. We're going to bump that to release two. That prevents the scope creep. So good product line management manage the scope creep. The new requirements get bumped to the next release. Sometimes it can't. You find, oh, that's really critical. We have to put in a change order. We have to change what we're doing. But just knowing there's a release coming in the future gives you a way to bump some of those forward. The other tool is to maximize your stakeholder requirements up front. If you add the, my suggestion, always add taxes, postal addresses, financial controls. Always add those requirements to the document. Now the cost you estimate for the project is going to be larger. The odds of now finding a new functional requirement that's outside the range of what you estimated on actually goes way down. So you might find more functions that you missed, but not because you missed a major stakeholder requirement. So think of it as a tree, stakeholder to function to system. You're always going to have branches and leaves that you missed and you have to add. 
But if you missed the major tr a major trunk at the top, everything under it presumably got missed as well. So the more you can really refine, or the roots of a tree, think of the bottom if you think of it as a tree. But if you can get those stakeholder requirements in and ask you, what kind of a system can you implement that doesn't have to comply with regulations, policies, tax law, customer preferences, those are the things that just manage the business. That's what the augmentation project makes so different than just the straight automation. As industrial engineers, we're trained to look at systems that way. And that's, what, that's the value we bring. If we didn't need any of this stuff, we wouldn't need industrial engineers on MIS projects. If the job is just to implement the technology as system, we wouldn't have to be there. We're there to make these issues the reality. It's by doing these things that we make sure that the system solutions that are put in place actually have the kind of organizational effect that we're talking about. So this list I found has been pretty good. I don't quite use it as a checklist when I review a requirements document, but pretty close. I know what I'm looking for in terms of the first one there, inadequate or missing information, that's a pretty broad category. So the next slide, if I can turn on. You know, list for just that category, some of the things that tend to be missing uh, from a requirements document. There's a lot of stuff. Um, you know, the mission and objectives of the system, the operating rules, these are things that should be in a good requirements document, appropriate to that level of document. Obviously, I'm not going into a lot of detail on a stakeholder document, but a lot of these issues are really the, the basis for the functional document. Uh, just a couple I would point to, ambient environment information. You know, look at it, I, I work in healthcare now. Look at your typical nursing station. Alarms are going off constantly. What's the most consistently used function in healthcare systems? the button to disable the alarms. Not because the alarms are unimportant, but because so many systems are producing alarms that the next system they buy also produces alarms. What healthcare needs is a system to manage alarming. Rather than every system sounding an alarm, it should send an alert to a system that's managing the alarms. So I can tune how important an alarm has to be before it will go off at this nursing station. Okay. So if I've got a, an, an O2 sat alarm from one of the rooms, I want to look at that, but it's relatively unimportant. But I also have a code blue going on down the hall, that O2 sat alarm shouldn't even go off. I should be able to pull it up in the list, I can control it. So if, I, I need a management information system, if you will, to manage that ambient environment issue, rather than just having every system sound an alarm. Okay, imagine what your world would be like if every time someone touched a key on one of the laptops around you, the speaker made a sound. We, we mute our speakers today on computers in common areas. The earliest laptops didn't do that. Everything was tick, 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 you made a mistake, but beep. Okay. And if, if you sit in an airport and just listen to people's PCs all day. Because okay. nobody finding the requirements for those technologies considered the ambient environment. Um, that's, that's just one little example. Volumetric and frequency quantification. We write specs all the time and say, you've got to be able to handle the monthly load of orders. And no one bothers to write down how many orders get processed every month. So your functional spec has to give me volume data, or I can't write a system spec that will handle the volume you're going to receive. So not writing those things down. So like I said, you, I don't quite use it as a checklist, um, but it gets pretty close as I go through. Um, there's the requirements pitfall to consider. The current pitfall basically says that one of the problems we have in validating our data is if we're writing our requirements correctly, okay, some of the outcomes we're looking for in our requirements won't be evident the day we turn the software on. So if I'm putting in, say, a new order processing system or a new logistics system or some other kind of control system for the purpose of lowering my standing inventory, well, the day I turn the system on, my inventory is going to be what it was the day before. So how do I validate that the system I'm going to put in is going to meet the requirements if almost by definition, some of those requirements will take three, six, nine, twelve months to be met. The issue isn't does the system work, it's as I use the system and it has its impact, a year from now do I find I have lower standing inventory. So you've got a risk if you can't validate the requirement for a year. By then the team's gone, everyone's declared success. And that happens all the time in IX. We have a system that should have an impact a year from now, but a year from now nobody's there to look. And most systems, a year later, haven't fulfilled their mission. But nobody's there to look. In fact, they've probably done two more projects to achieve the same result. 
I keep doing projects over and over. I worked in office automation for a while. I can't count the number of times I eliminated the person in the mailroom. Dozens of times I've done projects that got rid of the person in the mailroom. Yet that person's still there. Could we weren't they? They wouldn't be gone for about six months or a year, and no one ever went back to check. Is it another project to eliminate that person? We spent millions of dollars eliminating a twenty-five thousand dollar position that we still haven't eliminated. Because we don't validate, we don't think through how things go. So when you're on a project and you look at to validate a requirement, if you're looking at a requirement that will not be met by implementing the system, some many are. If the new requirement is you've got to have a you have to have a password to enter into the system, I can validate that the minute I write the software. Okay? But for that subset of requirements that are longer term, are inventories down? Is profitability up? Are customers more satisfied? Those are the kinds of things I should be documenting my requirements that are very difficult to measure the day software goes live. So when you've got that kind of a scenario, first commit to coming back to checking it later. <laughs> we will come back and check. We are going to measure. But again, think like an MIS. What scorecard are you producing in your system that I can use to validate that number over time? Okay. In essence, we say define critical success factors. What is it about the system you're implementing that you believe is going to cause that outcome to occur in the future? And then have review sessions around those critical success factors. Okay. So I've shortened the time it takes to process an order because this new design eliminates batch turnover interfaces. All the interfaces are automatic, and they're all within our platform compared to the old system. So the things we found made the system go slow in the old days we've eliminated. So I can point to three or four characteristics of my design that map to that requirement. They don't satisfy it, but the, use, the building the system to have these characteristics increases my confidence that I will come back and find that that requirement is met later. So always think in terms of how you're going to validate that requirement going down the road. And a good requirements document, the stakeholder requirements are full of things that will probably need time to be measured. Like I said, customer satisfaction, costs, profitability, cycle times. Those are not things that turn around instantly when you put a new system in place. Most systems go into place as a legacy of things that are in the pipeline from the old system. You can't measure that. You've got to get a lot of data through your system before you can get there. So, uh, in terms of requirements advocacy, our job again, is not necessarily to define all these organizations. You might. I don't know your work situation when you go through. For a lot of my career, I was an tech, IT tech person, and all this work was being done outside of my view. I came up a little in the organization before you knew what I was doing. The system requirements for the code I would write, I could see a bit more of it. Eventually, I was a business analyst. I wasn't writing the initial stakeholder requirements, but I was writing the functional specs. And now today, I would get involved in almost any of that. But now I'm more architect working at the system. What, what are the stakeholder requirements and what are the major functional components that will be needed? That's about as deep as I get into a project today. Then the detail functional specs, the system specs, and the actual specifications for the code all get done out of my view. So you're going to have a spot somewhere in that life cycle. Your, your career is unlikely to follow that entire encompassed curve. So in this class, we're mostly focused on that front end. Are the stakeholder requirements right? And are the functions defined to support it? And do those functions include management information system controls? So do we have functions to support turning an operational transactional system into something that also can be used by management to really run the organization? That's the side of the system we want. So whether something is or isn't a management information system is largely determined by that functional level. There may be stakeholder requirements for control. Okay, that would also dictate it, but largely it's are there, are there functions in place that when used are being used to create a sense of management control rather than simply the processing of transactions as we go through. Okay? You've probably heard of or seen the V model. It's different in every book. I prefer to be only because of its shape. If they drew it a different way, it wouldn't be a V model. But but typically, it indicates that as you go through an IT life cycle, 12207, ISO 12207 is the life cycle I would recommend. You're typically doing requirements at the front of the life cycle. It's the first thing that happens. Then usually there's some kind of a design build activity like we talked about last week. So going down the V, we're coming down the Zachman model, basically, creating models that are more detailed and closer to the technology. 
our focus this week, not in this class, but this week, is just that first box. But the point is, in Zachman, is that each of those levels, it could be three levels, it could be seven, as long as it's a V, each level is responsible to do its own work and to define the quality criteria for coming back out the other side of the V. So a requirements phase isn't really done until you've approved your statement of requirements and you've approved your acceptance test plans. If you don't know how the, what the customer will look at to accept something, you haven't finished requirements. And a lot of organizations don't do it that way. They'll build the system and then they'll write the acceptance test plan. Well, there's a bias there. If you've already built the system, you already know what you want it to do, you're going to write an acceptance test plan to make sure it does that. But of course it's going to pass. If instead, before you design and build the system, you make a list of all the things you're going to test, now the people that design and build the system know how you're going to test it. So they're going to make sure it's going to work. So yeah, I'm gaming the system, but that's what I want. I want to make sure the system I build is the system I need. And one way to do that is to tell people up front how you're going to test it. And the same is true throughout the V. When I do design, I write the design specs for building the system, but I also have to produce the system test criteria to know how I'm going to test it. Basically, it's called you know, black box testing. I, I don't want to look at the code to figure out how to test it. If you ask the coder who's just written the module to write a test script for it, I guarantee it'll pass. Because they know what they wrote. They'll write a test script that tests everything they wrote. They won't write a test script to test the thing they forgot to write. It's only the designer that can look at the 10 things it's going to need to do and say, I'm going to test all 10 things. It's now when the programmer only writes nine of them, it fails the test. That's what you want. So when I'm doing requirements, I'm basically asking my customer, what are your requirements? What do you want the system to do? And then I go back and ask them, how are you going to know it's done? How do you want to, what do you want to see so we can prove to you that it works? How, how are you going to accept this system? Now, in a pure world, there's an acceptance criteria for every requirement statement. And to a certain extent, they're just reworded versions of each other. So if you're really writing those kinds of requirements at that level of detail, an acceptance plan is not hard to write. But if you're a little squishy on the requirements document, which most organizations are, the two documents might look very similar, but they might not. Someone can list, here's, here's our basic, the 20 main things we want the system to do, but here's how, what we're going to do to accept it. My requirements document, say for order processing, okay? There might be a thousand re functional requirement statements in an order processing system. I'm not going to, but to accept it, if I want to say, is this system acceptable to me? I don't need to test all those requirement statements. I test the tough ones. You give me an order system, what am I going to do? I'm going to do a, an international order for multiple parts sourced from multiple warehouses going to multiple customer locations. Because I know if your system can do that, it can do it all. I only have to run one test, and I'll know if I can accept the system or not. Because I know the thing that's most often broken in order processing systems. And if you get that right, it's almost impossible you got that right and didn't get the rest. So I can have a mountain of a requirements document, but a molehill of an acceptance plan, and that makes it acceptable to me. The point is, what makes it acceptable to your customer? If you've got a customer who says, no, I want you to, I want you to show me you can do this list of a thousand things, you, that's what you have to do. It's up to the customer to decide whether they accept something, not you to tell them whether they do or not. I know as a customer, I don't tend to have to look at a lot of detail. I know how software works. And if the, if the hardest thing to do, the thing that most often fails, works great, I'm done. Give me the system. So those acceptance plans come out, come out the other end of the V. But that's the key to this model, is to focus on more detail as you come down. You're testing things as you back out. But the arrows across, the acceptance criteria, the system criteria, the integration area, that's the point of this diagram. It should probably be a different color. That is the point. To say that each stage of the process in Zachman, before you go down to the next level, know how you're going to validate it as you come back out. And, and like I said, most organizations don't do that. They let, they let coders write unit test plans. They let designers write integration test plans after they've done the coding. And sure enough, systems pass all the tests. And then the customer gets them and they fall apart. Because customers don't behave according to knowing how the software works. They do what they actually need to do. So the, the difference is going to be fairly dramatic. So that validation, in terms of the kinds of testing we do in the software world, if you're not a software tester, you might not know all of these terms. Uh, but these terms on the left here are the kinds of testing we do 
in software. We test against the requirements, we do stress testing, we run parallel testing against the old system. So these are the kinds of tests we do, and different requirements will map into this. Most requirements can't be tested in all of these ways, but as part of requirements traceability, one of the last requirements tracings we do is for every system requirement, we identify which kind of test is going to catch a problem in it. Typically, we want more than one in case one test plan isn't catching it. So I want to make sure I'm doing all these kinds of testing at each level of the V. So you're going to have unit testing, integration testing, and system testing, which are largely technical things. The people in the software organization will do those tests. By the time that my IT function brings me a system, my expectation is that it pass all their system tests. So hopefully they stress test it. If I throw a million transactions at it, it won't fail. Their system test tested whether it will run in the environment. I, as a user, a customer, I don't want to test those things. I'm concerned with the acceptance test that validates all those requirements. The system might work great. You've built a great system. It passed all your system tests. You've proven it can handle a million transactions a second all over the world. Great. It's a wonderful system. Does it meet my need? Does it solve the problem? And that's really what we're after on that end of the scale. Okay? So... Requirements define the scope and the characteristics of that scope. Okay. The impact of poor requirements, as Deming said, is really unknown and unknowable. We never even know half the requirements we miss. So you're never going to be perfect. But if, you're pre if you get pretty good at prodding IS to stick in some more requirements, you're probably doing your job vis-a-vis -vis this class. Can we turn automation into augmentation? So your success is how many of those stakeholder requirements have you been able to plug in to get more management function into your systems. Okay. No project succeeds without an eventual successful completion of requirements. Whether it's phase two, phase three, phase four, um, projects to succeed, projects eventually have to beat the requirements. So I'm hoping phase one, two, three is really release one, two, three, not release one, 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 and finally we get it right. But different organizations are very different as they go through. Okay, questions, comments? Uh, why don't we take a 10-minute break, and we'll actually look at some requirement statements for the rest of the class.